There are four great questions that every human being who has ever walked this earth ponders at some time in his or her life. Whether that's the disillusioned teenager who commits suicide because they can't face the world, or the greatest philosophers who have ever walked this plane. All, at some point and in some shape or form, face these great questions that we all must answer in some way. Who am I? Am I just this physical body? Do I just have to come here, grow up, get into the rat race, struggle to get ahead, to have a two-car garage and a white picket fence and be approved by everybody? And it's all over before we know it. Or am I more than that? Who am I? Where did I come from? What religions on the face of the earth today have any answers to that question? What should I do while I'm here? I'm bombarded from all sides by moralistic advice and judgments from every conceivable brand. There's 20,000 versions of Christianity on the face of the earth today just to take Christianity alone. The advice is inconsistent, confusing, bewildering. What should I do? Where did I come from? And where am I going? Any of, you, any of you who surf the internet will see how many hits there are on this question of what happens after death. And all of the answers that we've been given are so bizarre, so emotionally charged, so childish, and lacking in any substance that most thinking people on the earth today have dismissed them as unworthy. I always think of that great French philosopher Maurice Blondel who said when I was a student long ago, it's no longer my intellect that causes me to have problems with what the religions teach. It's my taste. In other words, I want to throw up when I hear the things that are presented to me. So these are the four great questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What should I do to attain my destiny? And what may I expect when this life is over? So there are lots of people in the world today that are looking for some direction. They're looking for some answers to questions that plague them all. I mean, you do not have to be a religious person you do not have to be interested in God. You do not have to be caring for all of humanity to feel these questions. They come with our bodies and our minds, and they're clamoring for answers. They're clamoring for some meaning in human life that nobody is providing the answers or the direction for. This is a great tragedy, because while the answers are rare, very rare, they are there. There is a direction that we can take if only we look in the right places. And some of the great religions have presented human hope and destiny in such childish, mawkish, and sentimental forms that many thinking people have banished all hope of the divine from their lives. And that is a great deal to have to answer for. But there are answers. There is guidance, and there are things that we must do. It's not as simple as doing what I think God wants me to do. Because all religions, you know, have a franchise on God today. God is accessible to us on a brokerage basis. There are many different brokers, and the commissions vary from one broker to another. And a time may come when we will be allowed to have independent access to God in certain limited conditions and circumstances, and we will be told by the broker when that is appropriate. But direct access to God, of course, is off limits. 
Now here's the problem that we have that we are expected to live in the image of other people's gods or how they imagine God to be. And as a result of that heritage, we are not even aware sometimes that the ways in which we think about God and about the world are limiting our progress spiritually and our evolution spiritually. We don't even think of it, but it's there. And in this series, I want to talk to you about some of these great misleading, deceptive illusions that are presented to us and that keep us buried in the depths of ignorance and despair that we have all grown to accept as commonplace, as part of life, as the way things are. This is not the way things are. There are other ways. Now what I want to say to you today is that there is a way of thinking that really limits our development and our evolution. We've all heard of the flat earth mentality, which was there from the times, say, of the great Greek philosophers, all through people like Ptolemy up to the high Middle Ages in the 13th century with great philosophers like Thomas Aquinas. The world was flat like a great tray, as the Hindus called it. A flat place, stable and fixed in the middle of everything. You go out on a starry night, you look up to the heavens, everything is moving except the earth, right? It's ridiculous to suggest the earth is moving. We can see the stars and the planets moving. And that commonplace observation is what faced the whole way that the mentality that framed, say, all Christian belief, all Muslim belief, and all Jewish belief was set. It was set in that context, that the world is stable and fixed in the middle of everything. So we've got the world here in the middle. The earth is there. In the early times, it was flat. Later on, it became spherical. Later on, it didn't orbit. It was not orbited by the sun and the planets, but it orbited the sun and the planets, and so on. But basically the earth is in the middle of everything, and we are still thinking that way. What I'm talking to you about today is that the flat earth mentality, mentality is corrupting the whole way that we think about God and human destiny to this very day because some of the more obvious things connected with that worldview, of course, we have long ago jettisoned in theory, but many of the other less obvious forms of it are still alive and well with us today. So in the middle we have the earth. Above it we have the vault of the heavens. Everybody worthwhile is up there. God is up there, Jesus is up there, the Virgin Mary is up there, and all of the saints who have ever lived on earth in any religion, they're all up there. It's a corral in which everybody who has done anything worthwhile is contained. And when I die, I'm going to go up there. And depending on the credits that I've registered by doing what's supposed to be good, I arrive at this destination and Jesus and all my family members, my father and mother, whoever has predeceased me, they all meet me at immigration. And I cash in my credits for heavenly currency and go into a new life. It's the great ideal to which all of us aspire. What happens after death? Well, according to conventional wisdom, say in Judaism, in Islam, in Christianity, the three great religions of Jehovah, this is what I'm faced with, a reward in heaven with God. It varies according to the franchise, according to the broker, but the essence is the same. Now let me give you an example. Supposing, say, back in the early Christian times in, in pagan Rome, I was a believer in the message of Jesus Christ, Yeshua ben Joseph. 
And I am asked to worship the emperor of the day, say particularly Nero, Diocletian, whoever, as a god. I don't believe the emperor Nero is a god. I believe that Jesus Christ manifested the divine in himself. But if I do not believe and worship the emperor as a god, I'm going to be sent to the Circus Maximus, where wild beasts, lions and tigers, will be released to tear my body apart. I heroically go into that arena, holding fast to what I believe for the sake of God. I'm torn apart in terrible torments by the wild beasts, and I leave my body. So I suppose it's a legitimate hope that having endured that destiny with such fortitude and constancy, that something worthwhile is waiting me when I do go through immigration in the clouds. So, how do the religions picture what's awaiting me for that? Well, you know, in the old days, it was the, it was the, the uh, great poets and dramatists who told us about what waits us after death. People like Dante, Alighieri, people like John Milton in the English language. Now it's Hollywood. And what do most people who walk the surface of the earth today believe about what awaits us after death? Well, if we go by Hollywood, it has a lot to do with clouds. The biggest budget in any Hollywood, about, Hollywood drama about the life of the world to come the biggest budget is about clouds, cotton wool, and those machines that generate smoke and steam. Because heaven is all about clouds. The Old Testament told us that God comes on the clouds of heaven. It was meant to be an expression of majesty, transcendence, totally other than this world. But of course we make it literal. So now we have to have steam machines and cotton wool. And the picture of heaven is that I'm ushered in after being torn apart by lions and put sitting on a cloud. Now, when I was in high school, I learned that clouds were sets of water droplets in suspension, which means that clouds are damp, right? So I'm going to sit on this damp seat of a cloud, not just for a year or a century or a millennium, or a million years, or a billion or a trillion, but for all eternity. And I feel on this damp seat that I'm going to develop a colossal case of cosmic arthritis or rheumatism by sitting on this damp seat for so long. And why am I sitting there? Because I have what the great medieval philosophers and theologians call the beatific vision which reduced to the grassroots level mean that I, I can stare at God and this fulfills all my longing. So I stare at God sitting on my damp cloud and I'm closer or nearer to him depending on how rigorously I have observed his commandments during my stay here on earth. And I stare at God for a month, for a year, for a millennium, for a million years, forever. So this is what awaits me after enduring unspeakable torments to attain a reward in heaven as the church is presented, as the religions presented. I've been told I'm going to go up with Christ Jesus if I'm a Christian. I'm going to be happy with him and with all my friends forever. So we're talking about what kind of place will all of this take place in. Well, from what we've been told, from what we've heard from the pulpits, the sermons, the homilies, this is what it is. It's clouds, and I'm sitting on this damp seat, staring at God. Now, I know the philosophers have waxed eloquent on this. Most of the information that comes is no help to the people at grassroots level because it's too abstract, too technical, too philosophical. And to the philosophers and the theologians, it's no help either because they've already come round to that point of view. In recent years, there has been a deathly silence from all of the pulpits, from all of the religions practically, except the most extreme and fundamentalist 
There's been a deathly silence about what waits us after death because they feel that anything they can manage to say is so sickening and so absolutely unworthy of attention that it's better to say nothing. And I'm very glad to see that because nothing is a distinct improvement on what used to be said. But if you think perhaps that this destiny of sitting on a cloud staring at God for all eternity doesn't quite match your hopes that uh, you thought there would be more to come having had your body torn apart by savage beasts, there is more in heaven. There is entertainment in heaven. As far as we know, there's only one instrument there, the harp. But you can sit on your cloud you can play your harp before God for all eternity. I mean, after the first million years, your fingers are worn down to the third knuckle. Is this all there is? Well, according to the way the religions used to present it, this is all that there is. And I suppose I'm not to be too chastised for feeling that I have been sold a dummy here, that there is really nothing worthwhile waiting for me after death, so much so that some people said all the interesting people seem to be destined for hell according to the conventional standards and perhaps it might be more interesting to go there. So let's ask for a moment, what is hell? Well, hell arises because God is up there on his cloud. He used to have, I suppose, a telescope watching us down below because we're here in some sort of neutral testing ground. We're sent little, little trials and difficulties from time to time. And God, you know, escalates the voltage until we reach the breaking point, until we kick against the gold. And he notes the result in his little book of experiments with us. It's called the book of life. Nowadays, I presume, God has moved on with the times and uses a laptop. And he has got probably satellite technology. You know those machines that can read your number plate from outer space? Well, he's watching us, watching every person on this earth. I mean, can you imagine this sort of picture? Isn't this enough to drive God bananas? There are nearly six billion people on this earth right now. And according to popular understandings in religion, God is watching every single one of us, pagans, Christians, non-Christians alike. And we, he has certain standards. I mean, in Christianity, we have 10 commandments. In Judaism, we have 613. And in the Muslim community, we have over 700 commandments. This is a big job. I mean, you're keeping track of somebody, not just, you know, during office hours, but 24-7. Every waking thought and every sleeping act is registered by God on his laptop. And there are fewer Jews, of course, so maybe the workload for God evens out. Even though they have 613 commandments, there are not as many of them. 14 million, maybe. A lot more Christians, but fewer commandments and so forth. But anyway, everything is registered in this laptop, which used to be called the Book of Life. And when we die, and the Spirit is, is withdrawing the soul, God presses enter, and the score comes up. What we did positively, what we did negatively. And depending on the score, we're sent up or we're sent down for a destiny of everlasting happiness, which doesn't quite match up to our hopes, unfortunately, seeing that it consists in playing a harp on a damp cloud forever and ever and ever while staring at God. And we're sent down if we're bad. What's bad? Not obeying the rules. Okay, we're sent down. What awaits us when we go down to hell? It's something that varies with the climate. In ancient times, in hot climates, hell was always pictured as a hot place, a place with flames burning. In cold climates like Norway, and the great traditions that they have, hell was always pictured 
as a cold freezing place, freezing wastes. John Milton, in the time of Elizabeth I, combined the best of both worlds because he, I suppose, realized that you get used to anything with time. And I presume in a hot hell after 10 million years, maybe you get a little accustomed to the flames. And if there were a dial registering the degree of suffering of the damned in hell, well, after 10 million years in the hot hell, maybe that needle is coming back just a little. The suffering maybe is moving from 100% back to 98%. Immediately, that decline in the degree of suffering is noticed. In John Milton's hell, you are zapped over immediately to the cold hell where the needle goes back to 100%. And in due course, you know, you're back to the hot hell. So in any case, in Milton's hell, the maximum of punishment is always extracted for all eternity. So what have we got? We've got the earth in the middle, curved or flat or whatever, elliptical. Above we have the arc of the heavens in which everybody worthwhile is corralled. Underneath we have the underworld where the devil and his minions are housed and where everybody who has been bad goes when they die after one single lifetime. And we have various subcategories of that. Say in the Catholic tradition, we have a belief called purgatory, which means that if I'm not good enough to be brought to heaven, I'm sent to purgatory to be cleansed of my sins until I'm worthy to be admitted to heaven. And it was usually called burning a stain off our soul, which sin is supposed to leave. I remember when I was a child in, in grade school, I asked the teacher, you just told us that the soul is a spirit. How can there be a stain, which is a material thing, on a spirit? And she obviously hadn't given much thought to this problem. And she said, it is a spiritual stain. Well, I said, if it's a spiritual stain, how can a fire affect it? Because a fire is a material thing. It shouldn't affect a spiritual stain. And she said, it's a spiritual fire. Anyway, what I'm saying here in all of this, and especially about beliefs that have caused such agony, agony down the centuries, such as limbo, people, theologians who didn't understand their work, who felt that you had to receive the sacrament of baptism into Jesus before attaining the vision of God. They found themselves in a corner and they found that they had to say, say that an innocent little child who died at birth or died stillborn, that that a little entity never had the opportunity to be baptized in the sacrament of baptism. Therefore, they could not go to heaven. Therefore, they could not be admitted to the vision of God. And their parents were told, you will never see your child again. And that child will be perpetually banished from the sight of God for all eternity. I mean, the people who have put forward these beliefs, barbarous, ignorant, decadent beliefs, have an enormous amount to answer for. Because of the delusion, the deception, and the distortion that they have as, as inserted into people's lives. There is no such place as limbo. There is no such place as hell. It's we who have created it ourselves. And it's been worked upon. It's been seized upon. It drives the engines of religion. The fear of hell, the hope of redemption, is what fuels the engines of religion. So we have this grand picture of the earth in the middle, the vault of the heavens above, and the underworld vault beneath. I call it the hamburger universe. And you know there are aspects of that hamburger universe that we laugh at today, quite rightly so. For instance, if I want to pray to God, I look up to God because I'm living in the mindset of the hamburger universe. What about those guys in Australia that are looking in the exact opposite direction? 
So even though we look up to God, we sort of make a mental note somewhere, God isn't really up. Well, where is God? Is God anywhere? No, he's not. Is God a person? No, he is not. Is God a she? No, she is not. Is God a he? No, he is not. Because what we have done is we take what we know here on this, the lowest plane of all existence, and we impose those categories on the divine. And as a result, we've, left, we've been left with something so mawkish, sentimental, and inaccurate that it bears no relationship to reality. No, we think of God as a human being, enlarged, like us, but, you know, magnified. Like I project in a movie theater an image from a tiny negative onto, onto something that's 100 feet wide. So God is just a human being, magnified. He has the same faults, the same failings. Sometimes we say he's a she. Gender applies only to this plane. Whatever God is, God has no gender. So if we say God is a woman or God is female, it's a change. But it's no more accurate than saying God is a man and masculine. I mean, all of these childish images are holding us back. These are the ways in which we think about the most fundamental things, about the most fundamental reasons why we're even here on this earth. And we never even advert to them. So the mentality of the hamburger universe, we don't look up to God anymore because we know God is not up there. But do we think of God as out there? Or do we think of God as within, as the slogan is in the New Age? Well, all of these are putting God in a place, whether it's up or out or incredibly distant or right near. And I can never think about the phrase, the God within, without asking myself, are we somehow functioning in, in this belief, like you see in some of those horror movies from, from science fiction, you know, the alien entity that grows inside me and then bursts out through my chest? Is this the sense in which God is within me? A lot of us think in that way. God is not inside me as a container. What that image is trying to convey is that I am the divine. I am myself, the divine presence, or as Jesus put it, the kingdom of God within me. So we are faced with a mindset of the hamburger universe, most of which we, without a thought, banish from our considerations today. We know God isn't up there. We know that the Russian astronauts in 1967, when they came back and said they didn't see God up there because they were that much above the surface of the earth, we know that that's not something that's going to count against God. We know that these are futile and absolutely worthless images. But these are the images with which we couch everything to do with the transcendent. And as I said earlier, it's no wonder that most thinking people today have decided that none of this system of belief is worth their attention, and as a result, they lose all trace of the divine in their life. And they have no hope and no aspiration, and that is something that's going to come back to haunt them when they pass from this plane and will have an infinitely important negative effect on their destiny once they leave the physical body. Many, many hundreds of thousands of people are in that state today. And unfortunately, the religions have done nothing to help them. They have, in fact, guided them in the wrong path uh, for all of that. So there are some aspects of the hamburger universe that we don't think are real. Unfortunately, there are other aspects of it that are alive and well today in our mindset. And one of these is the quaint belief that somehow we 
are it. We are the most important element in the entire physical universe, the human race. And God has spent all of his time dealing with this race. He created us. It was a big job. It's the only venture in which he was involved, as far as we know. He created us. He got annoyed with us. He punished us. And he wants us to be uh, contrite and to make up to him. And he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who, according to religion, suffered and died a most despicable death of a criminal. Why? According to religion, to appease the vengeance of a savage God. I tell you, appeasing the vengeance of a savage God had nothing whatsoever to do with what Jesus Christ did. Nothing whatsoever to do with it. But that's the shape into which it has been contorted and distorted so that the message of Jesus is no longer recognizable. If he were on the earth today, he would not recognize his own teaching. He would not recognize the forms in which it's put forth by those who claim to follow his name. It's distorted beyond all imagination. I remember I saw some years back an interview in the London Times with a man who was de deputy director of, a, of an observatory in Arizona. And part of the task of that observatory was to listen for signs of extraterrestrial life. Now, it's worth noting that the way in which the signs of extraterrestrial life were expected to manifest themselves were through radio signals. That's rather curious. It's almost as if we, today, were being observed from outer space. And the only signal the people in outer space were searching for on this earth were smoke signals. We've long ago abandoned that technology of smoke signals. But we must ask ourselves, who says that if there are extraterrestrials out there, that they're still communicating through radio signals. I mean, that's primitive technology. Anyway, the director of this, or deputy director of this observatory was asked, if we detect signs of extraterrestrial life, what are you going to do about it? The man was a Jesuit. We used to say long ago, you can always tell a Jesuit, but you can't tell him much. They're a very learned group of people, extraordinarily so. So they asked the Jesuit, what are you going to do if you find traces of extraterrestrial life elsewhere? And he said, I suppose we'll have to find some way of going to save them. Now, there are some levels of arrogance, you know, that are so baffling, so mind-boggling, that you really can't say anything. And that's a case of it. Because we've convinced ourselves that we are it, that we are at the center of everything. No matter how sophisticated we've become, no matter many Hubble telescopes we send into space, we still believe, even though confronted with the mind-boggling immensity of even the physical universe, which is on the very lowest level of all that exists, we are convinced that we, on this little insignificant planet, are the center of everything. That we have had the exclusive benefit of God's attention and care since time began. If you look into the Deep Space Telescope, and remember this only sees, let's say, keep it to the visible universe. The mind is hardly able to grasp the immensity of the panorama that unfolds before us. Billions of suns. And God knows how many planets around them that we know about. 
How can we be so arrogant, so blind, so retarded as to believe we're the center of everything? I mean, it's only 400 years since Galileo Galilei was in danger of death for suggesting that the earth orbited the sun. And his mentor before him, Giordano Bruno, for they were together at the University of Padua, Bruno was burned to death in the Campo dei Fiori for suggesting that there were other planets on which people lived as we did and who worshipped God according to their lights. 400 years ago. That's nothing in the history of the race. I mean, anyone who looks back at our history can only be appalled, appalled at the small-mindedness, the hostility, the barbarism that have characterized our whole traverse as a race. It's been punctuated here and there with marvelous outpouring of genius in literature, in art, whatever. But by and large, the general picture of our history as a race has been despicable, limited, small-minded, narrow, and bigoted. It's time to leave all that behind us. But it's a relic of the Hamburger universe because there are still plenty of people today who even though there is no stake at which to burn you, will burn you in the ways in which it's done today, by ridicule, by ostracization, whatever. We've never got rid of the inquisitorial mind to this day. Why? Because we think that we as a human race are at the center of everything and we're at the center of God's care and attention since time began. It's a quintessential belief that comes from the hamburger universe. And even though we've dropped the obvious stages of that mindset, believe me, the flat earth mentality still corrupts and completely distorts our fundamental beliefs at a very basic level still today. And there are many other aspects of the hamburger universe still alive and well today. For instance, in the hamburger universe, obviously the world, the universe itself, was created a long time ago. There are many people, even in the English-speaking world, who believe that the world or the universe was created 6,000 years ago. I mean, I have a book in my room written by James Usher, the Archbishop of Armagh in Northern Ireland today, which calculated, based on the number of years the biblical patriarchs had lived, he calculated, counting back to Adam, that God created the world in the year 4004 BC, in some months, say like September the 21st at 9 o'clock in the morning. The actual time is given. Now, there are other scientists today who believe that the universe was created, or came into existence rather, about 18 billion, 15 to 18 billion years ago. And this earth about six billion years ago. Now, what we need to realize is that both these groups are in the same camp. Because if you believe that the world was made and finished 6,000 years ago or 18 billion years ago, you're still in the same camp. Because you believe that the world was finished and completed at some time. Therefore, there's nothing that we can do to alter that. Now, that is also a great fallacy. Because what we do learn, say, from leading-edge physics today, even though lead, leading-edge physics is unfortunately in a very tiny minority, is that we can change reality. And it's not some superficial adjustment that we can make. We can actually enter into the very womb of creation itself and make radical and fundamental changes even in basic physical uh, level reality. Now that, of course, is absolutely anathema to people who believe that the world was created and was finished. And there are some people who think of that moment when it was made, which a lot of people call the Big Bang, 
And it's pictured, say, by uh, Edwin Hubble, who postulated it in California in 1928. It's pictured as if you had a balloon which you started to inflate. And then you made little dots with a felt marker on the surface to represent the stars and the planets. You inflate the balloon. The dots get further from the center of the balloon and further from each other. That is the conventional picture of the Big Bang. And that, of course, is not how the Big Bang occurred at all. If you want to picture it in homely terms, the Big Bang occurred everywhere simultaneously. And what it does betoken in that regard is that there is a higher order of existence that preceded the Big Bang and that the levels below it take place everywhere, not from a central explosion going outwards. It betokens an order above it that science is only beginning to explore, say, in matters like string theory and M theory and so forth today. So obviously, there is far more to this physical world than the hamburger universe has ever given us a glimpse of. And one of the main issues that we have to draw from this realization of higher worlds above the physical and of the fact that creation is still ongoing in a real sense and not completed, whether that be 6,000 or 18 billion years ago, it's the same mindset. What we have to take from that is that obviously I have the ability and the power to take a very real part in shaping my reality and my destiny than was ever thought of before. I am not here a helpless pawn put on this earth to be scrutinized by a judgmental, vengeful, insecure, despotic, fickle and capricious God up there in the clouds somewhere, noting every turn that I make and every deviant thought I may entertain. This is garbage. It's madness. It's utterly beyond any compatibility with any known fact about reality today. But it's an image of the hamburger universe that we still carry with us. Therefore, if anything extraordinary happens in this world, we call them miracles. I hate the word. Why do I hate the word? Am I against miracles? Absolutely not. But I think the word is too poverty-stricken to convey the magnificence of what happens in those settings. But how do we think of miracles today with the mindset of the hamburger universe? Well, they're obviously rewards, rewards given by God for good behavior. If I've been a saintly person for all of these years and I behave myself, I mean my, my score on the laptop is getting, getting up to colossal levels and eventually God said, it's time for this guy or this woman to have a reward. So he gives me a gift. You know, I heal the sick or I raise the dead, praise God, or whatever. It's a miracle. And what's a miracle? Something done by God because I have behaved myself well or reached extraordinary levels of behavior according to his rules. Now what we know from even from what I've said here today is that we should begin to suspect that what we call the miraculous is not really miraculous and it's not really done by some intervention from somebody on high. It's simply someone who has discovered a deeper insight into the workings of reality. We might call it into a higher level of physics. St. Joan of Arc, 600 years ago, put it well, when she said, miracles are not miracles for those who understand how they were accomplished. And the doing of the miraculous was meant to be our birthright. I mean, Jesus himself said so often, and how, how often do we hear it? Never. He said, if you follow what I've been teaching, you will do all the works, the works is what he called them, all the works that I did, and greater than these shall you do. Oh no, we, we've never been told that. You know, we're, we're told to be subservient and to be obedient and to be of good behavior. Greater than these will you do. 
greater than Christ himself. He said it himself. And it's not written in some dusty cave in Egypt on a scroll. It's in every bedside locker in every hotel and motel room in this land. It's in the New Testament there today. Greater than these shall you do. What have we been told about that? We have been told nothing. Why? Because we are still being taught and we're still living in the mindset of the hamburger universe. Creation is done, therefore anything that happens outside of it is an intervention from above. No! Whatever we can do is simply the accessing of a higher form of physics. Does that mean there is no God or there is no guiding principle? Far from it. It's only in this way that the true magnificence of the divine can ever come forth. This is not, you know, people have such a limited conception. They think if we trespass into these territories that God is threatened and Jesus is threatened or Krishna is threatened or the Buddha or Muhammad. Surely, if these people were ever great, it was because they wanted to manifest the glory of the divine within, within us all. That means not up there, down there, or out there, but right here and now. They were only ever great because they did that. But the people who follow them have taken an entirely different path because the message really cannot ever satisfactorily be handed on. It has to be restarted afresh every so often to keep it true to what is real and at the core of reality. So what kind of God are we left with? The one who does miracles, the one who allows the saints to levitate as, as a reward for good behavior. Levitation is a physical fact. It occurs because another natural force called the Torsian field works against gravity. And when a sufficient level of torsion field is generated, it overcomes the force of gravity, which is, after all, the least powerful of all the great four forces of which we know. Is it a miracle? No. Will you attain that ability with the mindset of the hamburger universe? Absolutely not. Can you attain the mindset which will generate that sort of field? Yes. It's our birthright, just as Jesus said, all these miracles are our birthright. But in the mindset of the hamburger universe, which is the mindset of religion, you will never attain that destiny. You will be kept enclosed. You will have to go through all of these engines of emotion, from redemption at the bottom, when you're steeped in sin and guilt, up to salvation at the top, the roller coaster that drives the engines of religion, the roller coaster of emotion. So what kind of God is behind all of this? Obviously a savage God, if he has demanded the sacrifice of his only son in the most horrible death imaginable to make up for some puny offense committed by an insignificant human being in the remote past. Has he held a grudge for all these aeons that it's still required? I mean, this is madness. This has nothing to do with God or Jesus or Krishna or the Buddha or Muhammad. Nothing. But we're told it is. It has everything to do with him. And unfortunately, the picture of God that comes out of all of this is what I call the God of the gaps. The gaps in what? the gaps in human power and knowledge, the gaps in human ability to cope. Let's take it this way. Suppose I represent the entire gamut of human reality by a circle. In the beginning, all answers to questions were religious answers. For example, if there's a great storm at sea, it's attributed to the god Poseidon. If I fall in love, it's attributed to the god of love. If I go to war, it's because the god of war, Mars, wants it to happen. If I get a disease, it's because some demon 
has infected me. Even Jesus spoke about that in New Testament times. Then, as human knowledge started to progress, we found, for instance, that it was not Zeus who sent bolts of lightning from the clouds. It was due to electrical discharges in the atmosphere. So Zeus was out of a job with his thunderbolts. It was not Poseidon, but climatic forces that caused storms at sea. And it wasn't Mars or the demons of disease that caused me to get sick or to go to war or whatever, or to have good fortune or bad fortune. So what's happened in this great circle where all, relig where all religious questions were answers to everything at the start, God, who's always in the realm of the mysterious and the inexplicable, God's territory begins to shrink as human knowledge grows and as human ability to understand and control what we experience went. So what we have is, as human knowledge grows, the territory, the turf of God is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. As human knowledge grows, God's place in reality gets more and more tiny. God is a refugee. God is always on the run from the advance of knowledge. And a time will come when there will be no place at all left for God if that is how we think of God. And that's why I call it the God of the gaps mentality. Because the only place left for God to exist is in the gaps in human knowledge and the gaps in human power to cope with sickness and disease and so forth. So this, unfortunately, is the relics of the Hamburger universe that remain with us today. And there are, of course, a list of other consequences of that form of belief that are alive and well today. We have moved away from the flat earth. We have moved away from thinking as heaven up there. We have moved away from belief in hell, though I have noticed in, in my own experience that there are a lot of people today who don't believe in hell, because they don't want to face the prospect, but still believe in the devil. So the devil has become a homeless person. All of this is not just primitive and unenlightened. It's a deadly deception that is inserted into our way of life, into the forms of thought that, that are projected for our imitation, and into the ways of behavior that are regarded as calculated to attract God's approval. The human race today is in a really bad state, mainly because most people do not want to wake up. They want to be told how to behave. Instead of understanding their own power, and I remember once at his inauguration, Nelson Mandela said a very striking thing. He said, it's not our weakness that frightens us. What frightens us is our power. And once we begin to suspect the power that we actually do have, we get afraid. We run from it. Because even though we've long left childhood, we still want that great parent up in the sky who will substitute for the human parents we had, who will take care of us, who will rock us to sleep and tell us that all is well, who will tell us to put our trust in Christ Jesus. And we don't need to worry about a thing. Tragically, by the time that we find out that that has done nothing for us, it's too late because we're already dead. So why, as a human race, are we so frightened of our greatness? Is it because we feel we are tempting God? Is it because we feel we are basking in the sin of pride and are going to become prey to Satan and to damnation? Well, if you think that, perhaps you should consult your own basic texts. Perhaps you should read your own New Testament. 
Because there was a famous occasion when Jesus was preaching and he was quoting Psalm 82 and he said to them, you are all gods, you, my hearers. And they took up stones to kill him, to stone him to death. He said, for what are you stoning me? Your own scripture says this, that you are all gods. Now you do not have to go to some dusty cave in Egypt to find this. As I said earlier, it's in every hotel room and motel room in this land. Open the bedside locker. And there, find the Gospel of St. John. In chapter 10, verse 34, you will find what he said. But their minds were so closed to their own greatness that even when he quoted their own scriptures to them, which said exactly the same thing, the divinity of human beings, they still wanted to kill him. And he had to pass through them, through his own power. And why do you think of miracles as extraordinary gifts of God, bestowed as rewards for good behavior on saintly beings? Jesus said again in the Gospel of St. John, in chapter 14, he said, Speaking of all the miracles that he did, he called them works. He said, if you believe in me and what I have taught you, you will do all of the miracles that I have done. And greater than these will you do. In chapter 14 of St. John, you will find that written. It's in your own scriptures. It's what you yourself profess to believe in. It's there. Why have we drifted so far away? And why do we not believe that that's possible for us? It's because we do not know who we are. And I tell you why we do not know who we are. It's exactly as Jesus said. He said, the Father who is within me does these works and the same Father that is in me is in you. And you can do all the works that I did. And greater than these works will you do. So this is why, as I said at the start, that the mindset of the flat earth is still alive and well with all of us today. Even though we don't suspect it, We've jettisoned the obvious aspects of it. But the really dangerous aspects of it, the really deceptive, deceiving aspects of it, are still alive in the culture and the tradition, especially of the Western world. And if we want to make any evolution spiritually possible, there are issues to which we, which we must address. It's not sufficient to obey some set of commandments, long or short, and to get credits for God. From, for good behavior. That achieves nothing. What I have got to do in this life is I have to make something of myself. I have to grow. I have to become. And the mindset of the hamburger universe is so deadly that that will prevent at the very outset any move whatsoever along the path, the path that can bring such liberation, such hope, such freedom from fear, such freedom from death, disease, and inability to cope so that we are pawns tossed around by those people that we perceive as more powerful, more enlightened, and more capable than us. This is not human destiny. It's time for a change, and the change is ready now. It's up to us to open in order to be able to receive it. Mm -hmm.